Sound like them. Sorry, I haven't seen a lot of people. Sound like them. I just got in. Just got in. It was a long flight, and boy, are my arms tired. Okay. Uh, anyways, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam. The guy who's 10 seconds late, he's like, oh, the really bad joke. Okay. Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salam, ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mawla. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala Ali Muhammad. Wabad. So, how many of you know that I was supposed to get here this morning? Okay. Long story short, I was supposed to get here at about 11 a.m. Um, I've been up since 4 a.m. Uh, I was in Memphis uh, doing some programs and visiting my in-laws. And alhamdulillah, uh, my flight was at 6 in the morning. My plan was to get here at maybe around noon, take a nice long nap for about seven hours, and prepare a, prepare a speech, and then, you know, deliver the talk, have a good time, chill with the brothers, have some pizza, you know, typical MMYC stuff. MashaAllah. So, what happened, <laughs> who gave a tuck beer for that? What ended up happening was, my flight from Memphis got to Atlanta. Atlanta was where uh, my connection was. And subhanAllah, it was not written for me to fly in that plane because the plane actually left 20 minutes early. I know we've all heard of planes leaving late, but this plane actually took off 20 minutes early. And not only me, but also about like 30, 30 to 35 people, very angry people, um, were also left out. And as I was getting my ticket, my new ticket for a new flight, um, there was a lot of people using a lot of bad language that I don't want any of you to ever say uh, behind me. And that poor lady behind the desk was like almost in tears. But I wanted to say one thing, and subhanAllah, for me, it was kind of a test. It was musiba. Because every year since I've been coming to MMYC with Brother Saqib, mashallah, and his, and his wife Aisha, who introduced me to this conference in the first place that Brother uh, Halim and Irfan Shatari started, I've taken it for granted that I would always be here. And even though that I was in, even when I was in Memphis, I was talking to my wife and my brother in law, I was telling them, I wish you can come to this conference. There's something so unique about this conference. I don't think any other place that I've been, any other conference that I've spoken at, any other group of people that I've met can match MMYC in Michigan. Takbir. <laughs> and I was there, and as the lady told me that the next flight that I can catch was 10 p.m., wallahi, I started to cry. Aww. <laughs> because I didn't want to miss this for anything. And I told her, I don't care what you got to do. You get me to MMYC. You fly me to Toledo. I will drive there. You fly me to Flint, even though I don't want to go to Flint. <laughs> who, who, who are the Flint guys here? They're not here? They're not here? Oh, subhanAllah. Man, weak sauce. Okay. You fly me to Flint. So alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to test me. And he wanted to show me that don't take things for granted. Because wallahi, coming here is more for me than it is for you. No one cares about hearing a big white guy with a beard talk. <laughs> Let's be honest. Maybe you guys benefit, we have a few laughs and we have a good time. And inshallah, we all benefit from it. But for me, being here is a spiritual enrichment that I can't get anywhere else. Very few places. And so coming here is a treat. And coming here as a speaker is an even bigger treat. Because I'm not speaking to a group of people that are below me. I am your servant. I am the servant of Allah and I'm trying to serve you. So I'm offering suggestions. And this talk tonight, the topic I was given is about modesty. And modesty in Islam is something that is extremely important. I was going to get a niqab and a jilbab and wear it and say this is modesty, but I figured that that would defeat the purpose of a 45-minute speech. What I really wanted to talk to you all tonight, and I'm, this isn't a lecture because a lecture, as I say before, a lecture is something that you give to someone when you're angry. And I don't even know you guys, so I can't be angry at you. So we're going to call this a chill session, right? This is just a chill session. We're just going to have a good time, right? Woo! None of that. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Modesty is something in Islam that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, everyone should say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in a hadith, he said that every religion has a defining characteristic. Every religion that has come from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has something that sticks out. And he said, the characteristic that sticks out from Islam and the message that I was given, the Quran and the Sunnah, is modesty. Many times, we think of modesty, and the first image that comes to our head is what? I already said one, right? MashaAllah, maybe a sister who wears niqab and jilbab. Anyone else? Raise your hand. Give, give me something. Modesty. What comes to your head? Yeah, yellow. 
Huh? Close. Lowering the gaze. Adam, sound like how you doing? I heard you going to state, mashallah. I think they're I think they're losing. Are they lost? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Okay. Guys, guys, guys and girls. Guys and girls. We have we have an amazing speaker next, so I don't want to take over my time. Uh, Sheikh Azam Hashmi, I don't want to take his time. Yes, Adam. Humble, being humble, humility. Actions. Sorry, both of you. You said what? Quiet. Quiet. Yes, sister. Being modest in the way you talk. So we all have different images, right? Some of us went physical, some of us went intellectual, and some of us went spiritual. And as I was preparing this talk on two hours of sleep on a plane with some dude, I swear to God, he was, he was drooling on my shoulder. <laughs> as I, and you know what? Let him drool. If he had a good sleep, okay. All right? Because I've drooled on my mom's shoulder plenty of times, so now I know how it feels. As I was preparing the speech on a plane, on many planes, by the way, I got stuck in Atlanta for seven hours, and so I went to this, mashallah, they have an MSA conference, the East Zone conference, so I, I just went, and it was pretty random. Everyone's like, why are you wearing sweatpants? Do you want to speak? I was like, no. So anyways, so as I was preparing this talk, I thought to myself, and subhanAllah, you guys hit it right on the head. The three things, the three components of modesty that we're going to talk about tonight are the spiritual, the intellectual, and the physical. Because many of us have already achieved at least one of these three things. But when we're going to break it down, inshallah, we're going to talk about it real quick. I don't give long speeches. For many of, the, for many of the, whoever has been in one of my talks, I try to cut it short because, no one, again, no one wants to listen for a long time. Right? We're going to talk about these three things and how these three aspects of modesty, the spiritual, the intellectual, and the physical, are cures for diseases that can really bring us down. The first I want to talk about is the spiritual. Because the Prophet Sallallahu as he taught us in many numerous ahadith, that the heart is the center of the body. The heart is the spiritual center, the command center, right? Like everything else, you have like the, the, the raita, the naan, and the heart is like the biryani, it's like the main dish, right? It's like right there. That's it. So first we got to talk about the heart. And what I want to talk about is not what a modest heart looks like. Not what a person with a modest heart acts like. I want to talk about what they don't act like. I want to talk about the opposite. Because one way to know the cure for spiritual diseases is to know the symptoms of the disease itself. Right? Yes or no? So if we know, if we know, that one of, the, one of the, the symptoms of a hypocrite is someone who lies, then we know how to fix that and not be a hypocrite. Stop lying. Right? All right. So the heart and the spiritual diseases of immodesty in the heart. When you break it down, when you look at the ayat, specifically from Surah Qaf, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about certain people who will be thrown into hellfire. And he gives them two characteristics. Number one, that they were rebellious. And number two, they were ungrateful. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ألقيا في جهنم كل كفار عنيد من عل الخير. These are people who covered up the truth, and they stopped any goodness from happening. They were rebellious against Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Allah سبحانه وتعالى gave them blessings. He blessed them with so many things. He gave them the ability to do so many things. He gave them amazing eyesight. He gave them a beautiful body. He gave them the ability to hear, to sing beautifully, to talk. And they used all of these abilities against Allah. I want you to imagine that your parents spend their entire life raising you. Picture anyone, maybe not your parents. Let's talk about random, a random parent, right? Baba Muhammad, right? Abu. And he has a son named Ahmed. And Ahmed's born. Now many of us as babies, can anyone say that babies have like taken a self-defense course and they can like protect themselves from anything, All right? And then you always have the one or two guys who are like, yes, I'm going to be funny now. No, babies cannot protect themselves, okay? I'm the only funny one here, okay? Thank you. So, you're born, a child is born, Ahmed is born, and for the first few years of his life, I would say maybe for the first seven or eight, he is completely under the tutelage, under this, the guidance, under the bottle of water. 
under the complete protection of his parents. Do you guys want to take a sip? I sip this Sorry. The plane was hot. Okay. He's completely under the protection of his parents. Everything, food, drink, clothing, shelter, love. Love actually should probably come before food. All come from his parents. So he grows up. He turns 10 years old. He wants a PS3. Daddy, I want a PS3. I don't play Call of Duty. You're only 10. Why are you playing games that are rated for 21-year-olds? But Baba gets it for him. Right? If you get 100% on that geometry test, I'll buy you what you want. He gets it. He nails it. He gets what he wants. He turns 16. Dad, all my friends have cars. I promise if you give me a car, I'll go to the masjid. I'll do whatever you want. I'll take out the garbage. I'll slaughter the goat with you next Eid. I'll do whatever you want. Baba buys him a car. 18-year-old comes. What do you guys do when you're 18? Get married, inshallah. <laughs> Careful, sisters. Run away quick. No, I'm joking. No, I got married when I, I, got married when I was 19. Alhamdulillah. Anyways. What do you do when you're 18? Someone. College, right? You go to college. You leave your nest. For many of us, you go away from your parents. And if it's not in college, after college, you leave. Now, when we talk about people who are ungrateful and rebellious towards Allah, I want you to imagine the love that a parent has for Ahmed. The amount of money that, Ahmed, that Muhammad spent on his son. Muhammad wanted to buy a car so bad, a new car, but instead he spent all of his savings on buying Ahmed a car. Muhammad wanted to put that new, remodel the bathroom for his wife, or remodel the kitchen, or remodel the living room, or get a new entertainment system so he can watch cricket. But instead he spent it on his kids' college tuition. He wanted to go buy a new set of clothes, but his son comes home with a speeding ticket. Dad, I need you to pay this for me. All the sacrifices, all the love, all the mercy, uncompromising love that our parents give to us. And then Ahmed turns around one day and says, you haven't done jack crap for me, Dad. You haven't done anything for me. You're worthless. And then he drives away in the car that his dad bought him with the college degree that his dad paid for, nourished by the food that his parents fed him, loved with the heart that his parents gave him, nurtured. And know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you more than your parents. So when we disobey Allah, when we are immodest in our spiritual being, when we deny using the blessings that Allah gave us for him, we take the gifts that Allah gives us and we throw it back at his face. I don't need it. So that is a disease that we must crush. Being spiritually immodest is something that will bankrupt all of your good deeds. You are ungrateful to Allah. You don't think that anything, everything you do, I did it. I got an A on that test. I am doing well in school. I hit that game-winning three-pointer. I beat my friend in Call of Duty. I look good. I look good in this outfit. My body looks great. I work out. I'm huge. I'm ripped. No. Allah made you that way. Allah gave you those things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he chose to withhold one breath from you, it'd be over. How many breaths do you guys take in a minute? Someone said one. I'm really scared. Let's say you take on average 30, right? One for every two seconds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes away one minute of, of breath from you. What happens? Faint, die. The people, the same people who are using the same faculties, the same eyesight Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, people are watching things on the internet they're not supposed to look at. People are looking at the sisters they're not supposed to look at. Sisters are looking at the brothers they're not supposed to look at. The same mouth he gave you with the beautiful speech, talking to people, talking back to your parents you're not supposed to talk back to. Backbiting my people you're not supposed to do. And I'm not saying this as a, as a speaker who's way above you people. I am perfect. You are all worthless. No. We all have flaws, we all have mistakes, and that's why we come here to get better together. Right? Right? Yes. So think about this. Your time is running up. Your time and my time. <laughs> think about this. When you analyze your heart and the quality of being immodest in your heart, think about that single quality. 
the lack of gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how being unthankful, not thanking Allah, not using. And how do you thank Allah? You use what He gave you for His sake. And that is what will make you a spiritually modest person. Next, intellectual humility. How many of you are honor roll students? How many of you did it by yourself without the help of Allah? Very good. Well, we're getting somewhere. Put your hand down a little bit slow, brother. No one look at him. I'm kidding. I love you, mashallah. Intellectual humility. And with this, I want to get the point across of the story. How many of you know who Iblis is? Iblis. Do we have any, do we have any Hafad here? Do we have any Hafad? Hafiz? Any, anyone, anyone Hafiz of Quran here? Okay, so the ayah in Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, who can finish it for me? What's called Rabbuka lil malaikiti? Asjudu al-Adam? Fasajadu illa? Iblis. Okay, who can translate it for me? Everyone quiet, one person raise their hand. Yes, brother in the green. Yeah, louder please, louder. Uh, uh, uh. Who was told about? What's called a Rabbuka lil malaika? Okay. Mm -mm. Angels. What does the verse say? Malaika, right? Angels. Okay, no, keep going, keep going. Don't worry about it. What were they told to do? Okay. Accept Iblis. Was Iblis an angel? Hmm? For those of you, okay, okay. For those of you who don't know, Iblis was not an angel. Iblis was a jinn, but because of the amount that he worshipped, because of how good of a Muslim he was, he was hanging out with the angels, right? It's like, it's like a 16-year-old kid hanging out with the shiuch. What up, sheikh? All right, pass the mango juice. Right? Iblis was chilling. Iblis was the best out of all the jinn. He was the best worshipper. The angels, they don't have a choice. They have to worship. It was the way they were created. Right? It's what they do. I'm an angel. I worship. Hi, nice to meet you. Iblis had a choice. He could have been deviant. He could have been pious. He chose to be pious in the beginning. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the angels, prostrate to Adam. فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا Iblis," And they bowed except for Iblis. Hmm. Was Iblis an angel? So why did Allah say that Iblis didn't bow when he told the angels to bow? He was up with the angels. He was hanging out with them. The response of Iblis, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, why did you not prostrate when I commanded them to prostrate? Iblis said what? خَلَقْتَنِي مِن نَّارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِن طِينٍ You created me from fire. And you created him from clay. What's that all about? I can burn things. He just gets things dirty. But Iblis was not an angel. And because of that answer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that was the beginning of his curse towards becoming a shaitan al rajim the one who's going to spend eternity in Jahannam. But I ask you this question. And I make this point with intellectual humility, with the ability to be modest with your brain. No matter how smart you are, you realize that Allah knows everything. Iblis said, I'm made from fire, he's made from clay. And I'll tell you right now, that was the wrong answer. What could have Iblis said? Yes. I'm not an angel. You told the angels to bow, Ya Allah. I'm not an angel. Isn't that correct? Did Allah not tell the angels to bow? Did he tell the angels to bow? Is Iblis an angel? Could he have said that answer? Would he have been right? Yes. But his arrogance and his ability to submit to Allah with his intelligence made him forget truth. He forgot the basic point. His logic was gone. He couldn't even use the most basic argument back. Ya Allah, I'm not an angel. You told the angels to bow. I'm a jinn. Instead, he said to himself, I'm made from fire. He's made from clay. Completely forgetting the most basic of truths on that day. He was not able to say to himself, Iblis, you must intellectually submit to Allah. Does not Allah know his creation? Did Allah not create us? Does he not know us? Does he know what's good for us? And what's bad for us? So why sometimes do we not listen? 
because we are not able to intellectually submit to Allah and say, Ya Allah, I know that you are the most knowledgeable and that I have flaws in my knowledge. And I know that you know what's good for me and you love me and want what's good for me. And sometimes shaitan whispers to me and my nafs takes me off that straight path. Being immodest intellectually and spiritually will take you even further off the straight path. Being immodest spiritually will make you not thankful. Being immodest intellectually will make you think that you know better than Allah. That you don't have to do what he says because you know the answer to everything. I don't want to wear hijab. Why not? Because I don't want to. It doesn't make sense. My hair, when the sun hits my hair, it looks just beautiful. I don't want to cover that up. Come on, let's be serious. Have you seen this jawline? Why would I cover that up with a beard? I could model this jawline. <laughs> Dentists would die for this. Right? Brother, you're wearing that shirt from Baby Gap. You're 21 years old. <laughs> Have you seen these pectorals? I spent hours on these. I skipped Mugrab, Isha, and Fedra for these. Have you seen these biceps? It's how I open up a chark ends. <laughs> Allah says something to you. Allah says something to you. He says, and this is going to take us to our next point about physical modesty. Allah says something to you. And even though shaitan's going to say, no, nah, it doesn't make sense. There's a hadith. You guys know what Masah is? Wiping over the socks? Without talking about the conditions, leather, whatever, without any, you can ask the, your imams at your message for that answer. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said something very interesting about wiping over your socks. When you wipe over your socks, where do you wipe? The top. Do you wipe the bottom? Does that make sense? Does the top of your sock hit the floor? No, unless you walk really weird. <laughs> right? Only the bottom hits the floor. Why do you wipe the top? Because that's the sunnah. That's the way the Prophet did it. And he is, mashallah, the coolest of all creation. May Allah wa sallam Sayyidina Muhammad. He did it one way. We intellectually submit to the Quran and Sunnah. We're not going to say, this doesn't make sense. I'm going to wipe on the bottom of my socks. No, you're doing it wrong. You follow what Allah and the Prophet sallam said because they have already proven to you that Islam is the haqq. It is the truth. And it is beautiful. And it is a happy way of life. The third and final way. The third and final. You guys want me to keep going or should I stop? Okay. Okay, Jazakallah khair. May Allah bless all. I love you all for the sake of Allah. The third and final way. The third and final characteristics of being immodest is physical immodesty. You have the spiritual immodesty of the heart where you reject and you're not grateful and you're not thankful and you're arrogant over the gifts that Allah gave you. Inshallah, we're not going to be amongst those people, right? Then you have the intellectual immodesty where you say, Ya Allah, I know better than you. This doesn't make sense to me. This whole Quran thing doesn't make sense to me. I read it, it just doesn't make sense. And by the way, if you read it and it doesn't make sense, don't give up. Don't give up. Give it a chance. Come talk to one of us brothers. Talk to your counselor. Ask them for help. I know sometimes it sounds like Shakespeare. A lot of times the translation you're using is difficult. We can help you, inshallah. We can guide you to get a good translation because this book, once you read it, it will change your life. The third immodesty is physical. And I want to tell two stories for this. One about the sisters and one for the brothers. First, we'll start with the sisters, ladies first. Maryam alayhi salam. Maryam alayhi salam grew up a very righteous girl. She was always at the masjid, worshiping, gaining knowledge. She was born into the family of prophethood. If you're talking about someone in the community who is seen as like the achabachi, right, the perfect girl, this is her. And her character was supreme, sublime. There was no comparison for someone like her. She was absolutely incomparable in her time, and even now. So much so that all Abrahamic faiths have nothing bad to say about her. SubhanAllah. Islam, Judaism, and Christianity all accept her as the purest woman. Maryam alayhi salam. One day, who knows what happened with Maryam? She gave birth to Isa alayhi salam. Did she have a husband? No. And real quick, without getting too detailed, you need to have a husband in order to have a kid and a wife, okay? But this was a miraculous birth. This was a miraculous birth. This was a birth of a prophet. This was a birth that would never happen again. It has never happened before. It has, ever, it has never, ever happened before that and will never, ever happen again. I don't care what Oprah Winfrey has on her show about some crazy Asian dude. It's not going to happen. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. 
This is unheard of. Now I want you to ask yourself, sisters, does the Muslim, does the Muslim community, okay, without, without criticizing Islam, because Islam is perfect, but Muslims have flaws, does the Muslim community have a problem judging people sometimes? Yeah. Brothers, is that true too? Yeah. Do sometimes we judge each other? Yeah. We do, and we need to work on that, inshallah. So Maryam alayhi salam, she is pregnant with Isa alayhi salam. She goes to the palm tree because she's in extreme pain. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands her, shake the palm tree. It will get rid of your pain. Intellectual submission. What is shaking the palm tree going to do? Sisters, how many of you have kids? Without getting like, anyone? How many of you have ever heard of how painful childbirth is? Okay, you've all heard about all the sisters like, oh my God. <laughs> what is shaking the palm tree going to do? What is it going to do? Nothing. If I told you, go shake a palm tree, they'd be like, what are you talking about? But intellectual submission, Allah is commanding it, I will do it, and it will work. She shakes the palm tree, and her pain goes away. Or it, it, it lessens, yani it doesn't go away, but it lessens. Afterwards in the ayah, she says, Oh Allah, I wish that I would have died before this happened. Is suicide okay in Islam? No. Is wishing for suicide or death okay? No. Prophet ﷺ expressly forbade it. We cannot wish for death, except for one condition. If Maryam salam, a woman who was not married, who would go to the masjid, who would study Islam or the religion that Allah gave her, which is Islam, who would, who would be pious in worship, who was from the family of prophethood, if she went back to town with the baby, what would the community do? Maybe not kill her. Similar to what they would do today. What would they do today? They would have gossip dawats. Everyone would talk bad about her. How many of you have been talked bad about and it wasn't just about you, it was about your family? They said, so-and-so's son did this. Their family must be terrible. What family did Maryam come from? Ali Imran, the family of prophethood. If people talk bad about Maryam's family, who are they talking bad about? Prophets. And who does that lead to? Allah. Maryam said, I would have rather died before this happened to me. I would have rather died before people could even dare allegedly call out and say that I committed zina. I would have rather died than have a community think of me as immodest. Physically immodest. I would have rather died, I would have rather given up my life, even though I'm a pious girl, and I have a long life to live, and I'm giving birth to an amazing son, and I have a relationship with God. I would have rather ended my life than have ever had anyone come close to saying that I'm immodest. Do we see how big of a deal this is? Do we see how big of a deal this is? And I want you all to know, sisters, that we feel for you. Us brothers, we know it's difficult. We know it's tough. I have three sisters. One of them, if you remember, last year I gave a talk, she left Islam. I have a wife who also has a sister-in-law. I know it's tough. These brothers know it's tough. But we support you. And if any of you have any problems with any sort of physical garb or anything, anyone's talking to you, looking at you weird, come to us. Come to your imams. We will get it taken care of. Because your relationship with Allah and following His commands is not worth sacrificing. Because you don't want people to talk bad about Allah because of any immodesty. Okay? For the brothers. Please stop. What is the talk show? Everyone, everyone. Mashallah, mashallah. By the way, I heard a sister put on hijab this weekend. Right? Okay. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's MMYC. Mashallah, mashallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you sisters and protect you and the brothers. Brothers, one last story and then I'm done. One last story. And please, don't give me a round of applause. Give a round of applause to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. Everyone say Allah Akbar. Okay. 
Sorry, that round of applause felt really weird. Okay, let's use a log bar from now on. <laughs> Brothers, one last story and then I'm done. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam was better looking than anyone in this room, okay? Let's get that straight. Yeah, you, bro! He's like, where can I read this? <laughs> Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his mercy and blessings upon him and his peace and tranquility upon Prophet Yusuf and all the anbiya was extremely good looking. There are narrations that say that Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam received half of beauty that was ever created and the rest of creation, the world, the plants, the animals, the people, everything, the universe got the other half. So he got one half and everyone else got the other half. You think Brad Pitt's good looking? You think George Clooney's good looking? Let's be serious. <laughs> MashaAllah, he was the most beautiful being. And there are some narrations that say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was more beautiful, but Allahu Alam, they were both beautiful. Yusuf Alayhi Salam was one of the most beautiful beings to ever walk the face of this earth. And you know, what he, you know what he ran into, brothers? Hey, Abdul, I want to go to prom with you. You're cute. <laughs> That's not prom, brothers. He wasn't running into a sister who wanted to go to prom. He didn't get that Facebook poke. He didn't, he didn't get a friend request. He didn't get any of that. No MySpace pic. <laughs> he didn't get those. I know what you're saying. Come on, let's be honest. I see your guys' pictures. Please. He got a woman. Brothers, real quick. This is really important. Because I know a lot of us are struggling with, with, with the situation with females. Muslim or non-Muslim. I know. I know. I feel for you. I'm not going to judge you. I feel for you. He got a woman who was not only the wealthiest woman in the town. Wealthy means what? She can buy the best clothes. She can buy the best lotion. She can have the best looking body. She has all that. Not only the wealthiest, the most popular, and she was known as the most beautiful. She was fine. <laughs> I don't ever use that language, but you have to get, the, you have to get like the, the essence of what I'm talking about. She wasn't like, oh my God, she was beautiful. She was, she was good looking. <laughs> right? By the way, Mehreen, she wasn't better looking than you. That's my wife, mother. Sorry, she's, I'm sure. She's gonna watch this for sure, I'm busted. Okay. So, she was the best looking woman of the time. And did she go up to him and ask him to prom? Did she ask him to go out on a date with her? She said straight up, let's commit Zina right now. Why are you guys laughing? She said straight up, I want you. Yeah. And by the way, how many of you know this new artist named Kesha? Ew. Read her lyrics. She sounds the exact same way. In my English class at the Sana Foundation, I did an analysis of her lyrics. The girls went from loving her to like hating her. We have like a dartboard of her now on the wall. <laughs> Anyways, may Allah guide her, inshallah. <laughs> this woman said to Yusuf alayhi salam, take me. I want you. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Even though I'm married, I'll cheat on my husband with you. I have money. I have everything you want. I'm beautiful. And in the Quran, it said what? She desired him. She felt desire towards him, and he felt an inkling of desire towards her. So whenever people tell you, brother, you're religious. You shouldn't have any problems knowing your gaze. Tell them. Prophet Yusuf had a little bit of issue. Not trouble, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects the NBA. But to show us that the prophets were humans and that we can relate to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us what happened in his heart, an inkling, a little tick. Uh, she, yeah. Right? What did he say though? All of us, we can agree. We felt that, right? We have issues with our grace. We felt that. What did he do? Did he ask for her number? Did he say, yeah, I'll hang out with you? He said, yeah, Allah, make the prison more beautiful to me than her. And Allah answered his du'a. He physically, modestly submitted to Allah. Spiritually, intellectually, and that came out in his physical, physical shyness. He said, Ya Allah, make the prison more beautiful to me because I don't want to suffer the consequences. I don't want to commit any wrong deeds. I don't even want to have the thought, the intention of being with this woman. So take me to the prison right away. And by the way, the prison wasn't like 
prison where you get like an hour of basketball time, you get to watch ESPN on the flat screen. Like it's not American prison. This is where they shackle you to the wall, where the people next to you are telling you they're gonna die, where they don't feed you, it's dirty, it's dark, it's dungy. Make that more beautiful to me than this woman. So brothers, I gave the sisters the inspirational message, mashallah. Whenever you encounter this issue of any sort of female temptation, ask Allah to take your heart and solidify it and make a fortress around it so that you don't have to fall into anything. Because just like Maryam said she wished she would have died before committing that, trust me, I've had brothers come up to me and tell me the same thing. Last week, a brother who goes to Fajr at the masjid came up to me crying, I committed zina. With a hijabi girl. What do I do? I just recently got hired as a youth director and assistant imam in Dallas. I'm already getting emails. My husband, married of 15 years, five kids, cheats on me for the last five years. What do I do? Don't think that because you're macho man, I know my limits, bro. Come on. I'm just going to go hit up some jamba juice. That's it. No. One step. One step, one step, shaitan comes slowly, but eventually he'll get you. And so make sure that we follow the sunnah of Prophet Yusuf and ask Allah to protect us, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, because it's not the fault of the person necessarily, as much as the fault of our nafs. So we ask Allah to strengthen our nufus, and we ask Allah to put us firmly upon his deed. Allahumma thabit qulubana ala deenik, ya muqalib al-qulub thabit qulubana ala deenik. Ya Rabbul Alameen, please make it beneficial. Please make our hearts attached to you and to the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Please make all of us have this weekend, an inspiring weekend, a life-changing weekend. Please make it easy for me, Abdurrahman Murphy, the person who people see as a speaker, but I'm really your servant. Please make it easy for me to practice what I preach and as well as all of us to practice what we've heard, inshallah, and ask all of us to, inshallah, benefit from these speeches and change our lives for the better because I want to see all of us in Jannah.